with True Imagination on their communication. And the reason that I'm standing way over here is we are also having a live webinar, an online presentation uh, during this event, and we are recording. So, I, so just to let you know, I want to thank you so much for coming to our Adventures in Asia and evening with Jim Pankratz and Bert Loby tonight. I'm seeing Martha. She's going to be, oh, there you are. Sorry, I missed you. You weren't side by side. So Bert, with Bert and Martha Loby, they're going to be telling us all about you got back two days ago. Right. So they are fresh off the trail with, I'm sure, stories and uh, photos to share. So I am going to start off by introducing Jim Pankratz. He is going to be our first speaker. Jim first became interested in India while studying religion at McMaster University. He completed a master's degree in Buddhism and a PhD in Hinduism. He and his wife, Goldine, lived in Calcutta for two years while he did his doctoral research, and during that time, they traveled widely in India. Later, they lived in Bangladesh for three years and traveled to India frequently. Jim has led tours to India for Canadian and American university students. Throughout his career, he has taught courses and done research in world religions, Indian history and culture, Christianity in India, and on Gandhi. India changed Jim's life, and he still finds it intriguing, challenging, and enriching. Most recently, Jim was the interim president of Conrad Grebel University College right here. Previously, he was the dean of the college for nine years. Please welcome Jim Pankratz. All right, I have to sort out um, which way to look. I have two audiences today, and uh, I, I want to figure out the angles here, right? And I, I see, you can tell me if it looks about right over there. Okay. So we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk to you about India. But first of all, let's just talk a little bit about travel. You're here, you've all, you've all traveled. You all hope to travel more, I'm sure. So there are four parts of travel. Let's think about those. The first part of travel, the first component is who you are. Who are you? What's your background? What are your interests? How old are you? What's your sense of adventure? So who are you? That's the first part of travel. The second thing is, who are you going to travel with? Are you traveling alone? Are you traveling with a partner? Are you traveling with some very close friends? Are you just going to go out there and travel and perhaps travel with people you've never met before and just find out who you meet? So who are you? Who are you going to travel with? The third part is where are you going? That can be a place. It can be an event. It could be some people you want to particularly visit. So who are you? Who are you traveling with? And where are you going? And the fourth part is, why? Why are you traveling? Curiosity, a heritage trip, like we were just on this, uh, this summer, uh, looking back in Ukraine at some of our family histories. Or for example, when my wife and I traveled to Winnipeg in January, people say, what? You're going to Winnipeg in January? And we say, well, our daughter and her husband and our grandchildren live there. Oh, if your grandchildren live there, we understand going to Winnipeg in January. So who are you? Who are you traveling with? Where are you going? And why are you traveling? That affects all of our trips, short trips, long trips, and it'll certainly affect the possibility of going to India. Let me advance this. Is it just the arrow button? Well, we will hope that hitting it four or five times will work. There we are. 
a map of India. Voila. So this is India. Before we go over the map, let me then use these four ways to speak a little bit about myself. So who was I when I went to India? Well, as Sandra said, I was a student in university. I'd become interested in India. I did some graduate studies, and now I was going to India. I was going to India because I was going to do research for my PhD. So who was I? Well, I was a person who hadn't traveled very much. I had been to New York City. I had been to Montreal. That was about it. So the first international trip in my life was to go and live in India. I had never before that heard the word culture shock. <laughs> when we experienced it, I didn't know it had a name. <laughs> but we experienced it. So that's who I was. Who did I go with? I went with my wife, Goldine. She's a nurse. We had been married for 16 months when we went off to India for my purposes, but to do it together. We went to India. Well, you see this map of India there. That's India divided up into states. And India is a constantly evolving country. It evolves in this way that some of these states weren't there 15 years ago. They were part of other states. And as the country has developed, more language groups and geographical groups have been separated out as particular states. It gives you an idea of the diversity of the country. So when we say we lived in India, we lived in a place in India, in this very large, diverse country. We went to Calcutta. Now, Calcutta is over there on the right-hand side, just before you get to Bangladesh, at the top of the Bay of Bengal. That's where we were living. Why? Well, I was going to do research for my PhD. The reason we were in Calcutta, because the person I was doing my research on had lived there in the 19th century. And that would be the best place to talk to scholars who were interested in his life. Well, what about our travels? What about my travels? Well, if I, if you see the map, maybe you can uh, spot what is Mumbai, up about two thirds of the way up the left hand side of that map, the western side, used to be called Bombay. When we got to India, we traveled from there down to the south, just where a yellow and an orange section meet, Chennai, which used to be called Madras. We went there, not because we were going to live there, but we went there because my professor was on a sabbatical. He was married to an Indian woman, and they were in her family's home. And so what we didn't realize, we thought it was wonderful hospitality, but the great blessing was that for most of the first month in India, we were living with an Indian family. We were living in their home. It was a very large home. They were both medical doctors, they had a clinic. We were living in one of the rooms in the clinic. Um, but there we were. My professor was an American. So these people understood us and they helped us to understand India. Very significant. And in that first month, after about 10 days, they said, you should see more of India on your own. They bought us the first bus ticket at the bus station and sent us on our way with no itinerary. It was up to us. And that took us around the loop of South India, around the point of South India, to some of the places, many of the places that will be on the tour that we're planning with Tour Imagination this coming March. That's when we discovered South India. Well, then we moved to Calcutta. We moved to Calcutta, and when we, during the time we lived there, we traveled a good bit. One of the reasons we traveled is because I expected that I would be teaching Asian religions in a university or a college, which is in fact what I did for much of my career. And I knew that if I wanted to teach about India, I needed to know more than just the city of Calcutta. I needed to understand as much as possible. Goldine will tell you, and she generally does it very kindly, that she was in a lot more temples than she felt she needed to be, and has been in many more temples, guarding my camera bag while I'm going around the corner finding one more angle for a picture. But we saw those places together, and it was good that we did. 
So we traveled a good bit. We traveled down the East Coast across to the center. We traveled at one point to Darjeeling, which is very much at the top right-hand tip of India, close to Tibet, where we saw the third highest mountain in the world, Kanchenjunga, a majestic, majestic mountain. We traveled to Delhi and Agra and saw the Taj Mahal. She and her uh, parents who came to visit us then traveled out of the country for a while. And I traveled in that northern area um, and I traveled to some of the pilgrimage spots, some of the holy cities that I could talk to people and, and stay at meditation centers and just really get an understanding of that part of Indian religion. And then near the time, the end of our time, we also traveled up to Nepal to meet some friends of ours who were working with Mennonite Central Committee at the time. So we saw a lot of India at that, during that visit. So that gives you an idea of who I am, who I traveled with, why we went to India, and some of the places that I saw. India really, really affected me very deeply. I had studied it for many years, but the most powerful reality I had when I got to India after studying languages, studying religion, studying history, is that I knew nothing. We got out on the street and we walked around and I understood nothing. There were deities, there were incense sticks, there were all kinds of things. And I didn't know what they were. That wasn't what I had studied. I had studied sacred texts and I'd studied the history, but all of that living reality, I didn't understand. Taxi drivers would have images, four images of gods or goddesses on their, on their dashboard. And well, he would ask me, understandably, who's that, who's that, what's that? And I would say, don't know. Oh, I know that one. <laughs> no. And it happened again and again and again. And it was so helpful to reorient me to say, I don't know the living reality. I need to understand how do people worship? How do they eat? Why do they go on pilgrimages? How does all of that happen? And in a tour like we're taking, that's one of the purposes of a, of a tour, to put us in touch with living realities. We can read a lot. We can see videos. But to be in a place and to do something very important, not only to look at it, not only to talk with your tour participants, but to look at it and talk to the people around you who are also coming to the same place, the people from India, saying, what does this mean to you? How come you're here? Have you seen this before? And then get that side of the story. That was transformative for our own understanding of India. As it's been transformative for all the travel we've done together since then, we've been to about 40 countries together and I've been to about another 10. And these places to meet people who help us to understand what we're seeing is incredibly important. When Tour Imagination talks about discovery and community, I think they have this sense that we discover, we discover with community, but our community is not only the people we travel with, we can make community of the people that we interact with and realize that we're interacting with communities. That was very important in my life. So who are you? Who will you travel with? Where will you go and why? The last tour we did of, of India that a colleague of I, mine and I did um, in October of 17 was focused on photography and culture. So some of the people who came on that trip particularly wanted to go because they'd get help with their photography. And they got great help both from uh, Al Dirksen, but also from one of the guides that we had in India whose specialty was photography and who usually leads photographic expeditions in India. So that had a very particular focus. And so some of the people came for that reason. If you're thinking of coming to India, you think, well, well, why? What is it? Some people that I know I've talked to about it, they, they've always had this kind of sense of Indian religion and spirituality that they want to interact with. Other people may say, oh, some of those places on your itinerary, I've always wanted to see those. So we can be different people forming community for a variety of purposes. Well, where are we going? Let's go to the next slide and see. We're going to India. Let's put India in perspective. There it is. By the way, there's this very interesting website, um, country size comparison. And you can use Canada and then you can put other countries in. So India is about one third the size of Canada. 
if you place it right there, it goes from James Bay down to pretty much the Georgia, Florida line. And then you can see basically from Newfoundland right over, oh, what, almost to about Kenora, something in the, uh, or Thunder Bay. It's a pretty large country. So again, when you say, I've been to India, well, it's like if you were at Montreal and Toronto. Have you been to Canada? Yes, but there is a lot more there. So just a sense, though, put it in proportion this way. India has 1.2 billion people. It's in one third of the space of Canada. But that doesn't mean they're all lined up side by side like that. You may think it does. It's 100 times the population density of Canada. Canada's four, and India is 421 per square kilometer. When we lived in Bangladesh, Bangladesh, when we left, had 100 million people, and it was one quarter the size of Manitoba. When we told people that in Manitoba, because at that point, Manitoba was about 1.6 million people, 1.4 million people. People. They said, it's impossible. Like, do you have room to breathe? I said, oh, no, there are fields there, rice fields there, river deltas. But people pack a lot more densely in many places. So that's the sense of India. So it still is a large, large territory to explore. And it has a lot of people in most of that territory. But it also has deserts and mountains, as, as you'll hear later about mountains. Let's think now about the itinerary we'll go on. What parts of this does this trip that we're going on cover? Well, it covers some of the territory that Goldine and I first visited, land in Mumbai, where we, visit, where we landed many years ago. Go down the west coast to Goa, which was Portuguese territory until the 1960s. Then down to the south, which is where the Portuguese and others first made contact with India. And then around the, the, across the south and up the other side to Chennai, which used to be called Madras. Then there will be a second part for people who say, I'm in India, I've got this one chance, I want to see Delhi, I want to see the Taj Mahal, and that's up further in the north. Now, these places along the west, particularly in the south, were major meeting points of Europeans starting in the very end of the 15th century through, of course, to the present. There had been a lot of trade with India, but that trade had come through Arabs and others who had been by ship up into the area of Saudi Arabia and so on. This was long before the Suez Canal, then crossing, and goods were coming into Europe, certainly. So people knew of spices, people knew of silk, people knew of cotton. But as travel through that area got more difficult as the Christian West and the, and the Muslim Middle East were in conflict, they looked for another route. That's why they came around Africa, came to India that way. That's why many of the first contacts are there. That's why on that West Coast, you find Parsis from the Middle East, you find Jewish settlements, Jewish synagogues, you find Armenians, eventually you find, of course, you find the Christians that I'll mention later, the Christians from the very earliest Syrian Christian church, First century, according to the tradition, the tradition is that St. Thomas, Thomas the disciple, was there and was the first evangelist in India, the Catholic Church later on. So that is a fabulous area for looking at the interaction between Indian culture and European culture. And there's so much evidence of it, and there's so many stories that are told. It's a terrific area to visit. Interesting about our itinerary, that itinerary that you see here on the map, it's about 2,300 kilometers total. Ottawa to Orlando, Florida, over Waterloo to Ottawa, back to Waterloo to Ottawa, and back to Waterloo. So it's doable, right? It's about 2,300 kilometers. Interestingly enough, it's almost exactly the same distance to fly from Chennai at the end of the tour, up to Delhi, as you leave the country or as you do the other part of the tour, 2,300 kilometers. So you get a sense of the area that we're covering 
and then also the size of India, because from Delhi to the very north of India would again be another about 2,300 kilometers. On this particular trip, we're going at a particular very special time of year, we're going at the beginning of March. And this time of year, this is the time of carnival. So we'll look at a picture of carnival. Carnival is Mardi Gras. India also has a Mardi Gras because Portugal had a Mardi Gras. Or, or what they don't call it exactly that there. But this was Christian Portuguese territory. And so what we're doing is getting to India at the very beginning of Lent, a bit of a celebration before it. And it's wonderful to arrive in a country and sometime during that time to be with people for one of their major festivals. They're rambunctious, they're colorful, they're energetic, but you see people celebrating. It's a wonderful thing to see that and to participate, to be caught up in the energy of that. It also helps that uh, beginning of March is also not uh, too hot yet. And uh, that's an important part of when do you travel to India. When you see that, that picture, you'll notice that the, uh, the bottom left slide is a, a very, very famous church. And um, we'll, we'll see that. The others are parts of the, the Mardi Gras celebrations. So what will we be doing? What will we be doing? Well, let's shift to the next, um, to the next picture. After the carnival, we'll be in all places. We'll be eating food, wonderful food, and learning about food. We'll be visiting a, a spice plantation. We'll be having a, a meal, a cooking demonstration, and somebody dis, uh, describing the basic ingredients. And when you're in South India, this is often the way many meals are prepared. There's rice, there's bread. In most of South India, there will be far more rice than there is on this particular platter, but there is. And then various condiments and so on are put around it. Coconut is used a lot, and lots of wonderful spices. So. One of the features, not only in how we eat every day, but one of the features of the trip will be food. Now, it's fascinating, again, on this West meets East. There are parts of the Indian diet today that didn't exist. They didn't exist before Europeans came there. Well, how could that be? Well, many of the chilies and the peppers that are used in Indian cooking now were brought by the Spanish and Portuguese from the New World, from Peru, from Ecuador to Europe, and then from Europe to India, and then were gradually integrated into Indian cooking. Indians did have spices and peppers and so on. But another example of West meets East is this interchange globally of food that happens. And so we'll talk about that. Some of the spice plantations in India now have indigenous plants, but they also have plants that have come from other countries, as happens in all around the world. Let's shift to the next. Here's another example of a movement of things around. These are called Chinese fishing nets, and in fact they are in Kochi or Cochin, along that west coast India. This was one of the influences of Chinese travelers over the years, over land, but also by boats, would be these particular kind of fishing nets. And they're, even though they're not really needed very much anymore, they're kept along the coast as one of the major tourist attractions. And many of the pictures you'll see will be at sunset. That's the, one of the best times. To, and this is a sunset picture because it faces over west. Shift the next. Another thing is tea. So much tea, of course, it may have originated in China, but it's spread all over the world. And with the colonization of the world, these kind of plantations moved all over to wherever people could find a place where the temperature was right, the climate was exactly right, the elevation was right. And tea plantations are beautiful beautiful places. You walk in here, many of the bushes are all sort of about, about chest high and people wandering, picking, they have a, a, 
and bag sort of sack over their back and they can they can reach and pluck those fresh leaves and drop them in. And it's a beautiful scene of people moving in through the tea plantations. You can walk along the pathways. Very often there's some trees for shade, lovely places. But this again is part of the legacy of West meets East as these plantations, there are also rubber plantations, for example, in India, and that wasn't indigenous to that particular area. But it's been deeply integrated into Indian living, into Indian diet, into Indian exports over the centuries. One of the other things that you get a chance to see when you're traveling in countries is art forms. This is a form of, of dance in South India called Katakali. And Katakali is a very, very elaborate, stylized kind of dance. A lot happens with the eyes that move very, very dramatically and the eyebrows and so on. But in most cases, a, a costume like you see on the figure on the left takes four to six hours to put on the makeup and the costuming before the dance. Um, it's a very rigorous form of dancing. It's, as I say, highly stylized, but it's a very high art form. And in different Indian regions, there are different forms of dance. And this is one that's particularly uh, prominent in the South. And we will plan on this particular tour to see a performance. Sometimes you get a chance also to come in a bit early and see them as they're getting ready for the dance performance. Uh, by the way, these people are really tremendous, tremendous athletes uh, when you see the kind of fitness that they go through to prepare for that. So one of the things we will see is we will see the beauty of landscapes, we'll see the beauty of buildings, we'll see the beauty of people, and we'll see the beauty of artistic forms. We'll also see things like this, signs of the church, particularly in the South India. There's a Catholic art museum. The um, Catholics have been in India actively since the very beginning of the 16th century. So Catholics in India have been there longer than Mennonites have been in the world. And uh, so that is one, one opportunity to see some of the history of that tradition. And we will also be talking with leaders of these, of these churches. So we'll go to the next slide. This is an example of a, of a church in South India. Um, this church is on a place traditionally associated with St. Thomas, Thomas the Apostle. And you'll see churches of all different shapes and sizes, but of course, distinctly, you see a cross. What's fascinating in the churches in India nowadays is that they've gone to some very, very elaborate new modern art forms for their churches with all kinds of lines and swirls and rounded edges and so on. So we will obviously see some of that. This is much more traditional, but the, the Christian tradition in India is very alive. It has its own artists, certainly it's its own theologians, its own musicians, its own poets. And so we will not be looking just at a historical artifact. As we engage with them, we will be talking with a living religious tradition which cherishes its past and builds on it, is very, very much alive and very is very vibrant. And then, of course, we will also see temples. This is the Meenakshi Temple in Madurai, one of the most famous temples in all of India. Meenakshi is a one of the names for the goddess Parvati. Parvati is the feminine goddess who is the consort or the wife of Shiva, one of the major gods. And she appears, as all Indian gods do, in many, many forms. And so in this particular region, she's known as Meenakshi. And so there are stories told about her in this particular place, why the temple is here, and what happened, and the stories are carved on the walls. What's impressive about this particular temple is that these towers called Gopurams, I think there are about 14, 17 towers like this that rise up about 40 meters into the sky all painted with elaborate sculptures. And then often there are large uh, hallways. So let's shift to the next picture. We'll see an example of one of the interior hallways that goes on for hundreds and hundreds of feet um, with carvings and sculptures. And these places are, they're like city blocks at least. And uh, 
again, it's a chance to interact with people there and to see this um, a temple like this, which was built way back in about the 10th, 11th century when Muslims came into India. They were horrified by the idolatry. And all across India, if they got there, they often smashed temples and, and destroyed them completely. This temple, although Muslims never really ruled this area, in one incursion, the armies got this far, and this temple was largely destroyed. And then after about the 14th century, it was rebuilt again, has been rebuilt then through the 17th and 18th century. So India, you know, maybe regarded often as a very peaceful country, um, but it has had its history and continues to have its history of tension. Um, there's a lot of interreligious relationship, but there is a, a lot of this kind of history, even when you see a place like this. This is traditionally just outside the city of Chennai, a place where Thomas the Apostle lived. Very simply, and there's this bit of a shrine there. That part of history is a bit unclear, but as you know, in a lot of our traditions, when you have oral traditions, they can shape your awareness. They can shape the way you live and the way you see your life. And if a historian demands that you, you know, prove in writing that this happened, well, you can't do that. But the story's been passed down and it, de it determines who we are. And we'll find a lot of that over there. And, then, and this is what we'll find in many parts of India. Statues of Gandhi. This particular statue is along the east coast of India in Chennai, along the, the uh, ocean front. There's a series of very large statues, this being one of them. Gandhi is very often showed this way, walking the country, very, very simple clothing with his walking staff, walking barefoot or something with a simple sandal. That's how he's portrayed and even images of him in places like Winnipeg in the cold. If you've been to Winnipeg and seen the Human Rights Museum, there's a statue of Gandhi in front of it. And I don't think he must be freezing. <laughs> um, there is one, by the way, in Westminster in England, where he argued with the British for so long, but subsequently along some of those prime ministers and that, there is a statue of Gandhi and much this kind of a statue of Gandhi. Um, so we will, in fact, in a couple of places, particularly uh, those who go up to Delhi, we will see the place where he was staying when he was killed, when he was assassinated. And there's a, a wonderful memorial to him there showing his footsteps where he walked to the place where he was assassinated. Um, in South India, we'll be in a city called Madurai where that temple is. And there's a major Gandhi museum there. And so we'll be able to learn more about Gandhi. And so that brings us not quite to the present, uh, because he was assassinated at the end of the 1940s, but to somebody that most of us have heard of. So throughout a tour like this, we'll be having our own experience, our experience with our group of people that we're traveling with, the people that we interact with, and we'll be interacting with history because everywhere we go, if we don't see written text, we'll see memorials, we'll see temples. We will, in some of these churches, see amazing memorials to the colonial leaders who are buried in these churches. And, uh, and some of the memorials are very, very moving. Um, one of the things we'll also do is we'll also be reading accounts of earlier travels, travelers who've been in the place that we're staying at that particular time and listening to how they encountered them when they had not yet studied what culture shock was but they were probably experiencing it in their own, own way. So there's an outline of what we're doing and uh, I'd be glad to hear a few questions. And if I hear questions, I will repeat them so that people watching by webinar can hear us. Any comments or questions? The question was, what did I experience when we experienced culture shock? We have very vivid memories of those first days. And one of the things that I think a lot of people will say, and we experienced it, um, we thought everybody was looking at us. Well, they were. <laughs> um, we, in the place where we ended up getting a train to go down to Madras, 
it wasn't that they had never seen white people before, people like us, but we were certainly the only ones around, the only ones we saw that day. So people were looking at us. We took that as, as almost like an imposition and realized later that they look at us and when we're traveling, we look at the people that we're seeing. But that was one of the hardest things at first, to be the center of attention, to want to say, no, I, I just want to observe. I just want to see. I don't want to be, I don't want to be the center of all this attention. Um, I think the other was, quite frankly, the, um, the density of people, the number of people, um, the noise. Um, we also saw within those first days, and then all the time, we saw more visible poverty than we had ever seen in our life. Much of that is still there in India, but much of it has changed. It's not as much visible poverty as there used to be. Um, there's, but what we found most difficult at first was, I think, the great disparity right beside each other. Very, very rich and very, very poor. People living on the street in front of a mansion with a high wall around it and the doors opening, the cars coming out. And seeing those two things together, you know, we had lived in, in small towns and that where, where people tended to be about the same economic class and had never been very much in a big city where you sometimes would see those things. So those were certainly some of the, the things that um, jarred us at first. Those are, those are physical, visceral as well. Later on, I will just say a lot of that became more familiar, uh, and maybe just a comment about this, um, our previous tour that we did in October. One of the things that's changed so much in India since I last lived there, and even since I had uh, traveled there last, was the cell phone. Not just the use of the cell phone, but everybody's taking pictures. When we first went to India, um, not as many people took pictures. People were puzzled by pictures, what a picture was, um, what, what did it do? What were we capturing and so on? Um, and there were a lot of people who would want to look away. And now we found on the tour, people are taking selfies of each other. They're inviting us in. I, I have some pictures of India that we might scroll later on. And uh, you will see that in group pictures that we took of our tour, look, people who were there also came and just stood in our picture. And they invited us to come into their picture of their family. And so on the one hand, it, it made it a lot easier to be there and to say, oh, I'm interested in that or that group of people. And mostly you can want it. They can turn their head. They can put up their hand and you, you respect that. That was one of the biggest changes that I, that I saw in sort of the, the everyday street life in India. Yes. The question was about gender and how people interact in community settings. Um, it's very, very mixed. You, you can be in parts of India or even certain communities in which the gender roles are very split. And one way to say they're split is the, the male is mostly in the public world and the woman in the private domestic world. So there still is a good bit of that. Um, and then women, if they move into the public world, would be more covered. They may not be fully covered, but they would even if they walk past you, if they're wearing a sari, they might just take their sari and just put it a bit across their face and avert their face as you come by. Um, so that's that's one part of the, the private public. And you, as I, as a man, would not be invited into certain parts of the house, which would be where, where the females are more. So I've eaten in homes where I, with other men, would eat sort of out on the porch, but not inside the house. But literally hundreds of millions of people live in much more interactive social roles. I mean, women are riding motorcycles, they're on the back of motorcycles, they're police officers, they're, they're driving buses, they're, they're in the legal professions, and, and people are interacting in social spaces, they're eating together, and, and all of that. So there's that whole range within India and so it can depend on the people, the exact context, and often, often geography. Um, and India is a place of enormous social justice concerns. And so India is full of advocacy groups for, for the poor, for women, for the disabled, for all kinds of the, very active, both men and women working in advocacy and often working together in advocacy 
advocacy. That'll be one of the things that will be enjoyable when we interact with people. This is a very rich, vibrant part of India. We're very, very fortunate um, because in India, almost everywhere you travel, the road signs are in English. In the places we would travel, I mean, road signs are English and other local languages. Um, hotels, and bus stations, and airline stations, you, you people speak English well, like very, very well at a high level. Um, and at most places where we would travel, um, tourist places, there are people who speak English, signs are in English. Um, it, that was not a difficulty at all. You can meet people for whom that may be more difficult, but it was very rare for us not to meet somebody at a site, an Indian who uh, would be beside us, and we strike up a conversation in English. But when you think of it, India probably has over 200 million English speakers, <laughs> which is a lot of people, and they tend to be in the kind of places where we travel. It makes traveling in India much more, much easier than in some other countries. Like, e even as wonderful a country as Japan is sometimes difficult to travel because English is used much less uh, frequently than in India. So that's a very, very great help to us English speakers who are sometimes monolingual. Well, I'm, I'm glad. Yes, there's a question. They're, they're there. Yeah. No, I'm not. I, as far as I, I think they're very restricted. As far as I know, you, you can you can go around the outside, but I have not been in one. Um, I've been to Bom Mumbai, which is where they're more prominent up in that part of the country, um, but I've not ever been inside one. Yeah, so you have a Zoroastrian friend, yes, yes. It's it's a tradition that's probably alive as much in India as in any country of the world, actually, right. because it's certainly not very welcome in Iran, out of where it originates. Well, thanks to you and thanks to those of you watching on the webinar. Um, look forward to the possibility of traveling with you. Thank you. Well, we're just going to take a break for a couple of minutes and um, you can feel free to grab a snack, get a cup of tea if you need to go to the bathroom, do that. And then we're going to invite Bert and Martha Lobby up in about five minutes or so. Jim will be available during the break if you have any questions, but he does have to leave for another event. So if you have a pressing question, grab Jim now. We're also going to be, during the break, playing uh, some photos of gyms from India. Okay, it's not advancing. Sorry, it's me doing it. Oh. oh, seems like it's doing. I think it's working. 